So welcome back to the channel, guys. It is me, eighty seven four four. So today, guys, we'll be doing your community questions, guys. We'll be answering you guys' questions for this month of October. And you guys really did seem to enjoy. You guys, we have a lot of questions to go through. We have like around twenty six questions, I believe. So we're gonna go through all the questions. And since we have around twenty six people that commented, we should be reaching at least twenty likes on this video, guys. And if we can get twenty likes on this video, I will be doing it on November one, of course. And remember, guys. If we get 2K subscribers by the end of the year, I will do my best to try to do a jersey giveaway at the end of the year. So if we can get uh, 2K subscribers by the end of the year, and if we can get 20 likes, we'll do a giveaway at the end of the year, and we'll also do a November edition as well. So thank you guys for commenting, and let's get on with the questions. So starting with question number one we got here is the Man City Trading Poet says, one player who you personally want to win the World Cup. Now, if I'm being objective here, that's realistic, I feel like, Neymar is the one I really want to see. I really want Neymar to win the World Cup. Because I feel like Neymar is a player that's done so well throughout the course of his generation. And he's been so unlucky with injuries, you know, decision, uh, you know, injuries and stuff. And I feel like he really needs a World Cup. And I feel like if he wins a World Cup for Brazil, we're having a very different combo on him. More people applaud him and respect him. More people consider him top 10. Because, you know, there's actually a debate among people that, Neymar's name in the top 10 best Brazilians of all time, which I think is crazy. Like, he he has to be in top 10. Sure, he doesn't have any international trophies. But the fact that he's carried Brazil, he's got Brazil to a, uh, Olympics, Confederations Cup, and remember, he's a top all-time scorer, and we're seeing how bad Brazil is without Neymar. You know, and so I feel like Neymar, for me, is so instrumental. He's always delivered for Brazil. It's just his teammates. Let him down, not Neymar himself. So anyone that tries to blame Neymar for Brazil's shortcomings the last couple of years, you're just a dummy. It is the team that underperformed, not himself. So yeah, that's my two cents on that one. Thank you for the question. Next question we got here is Adas Streak uh, King Angel says, "Who are your top three favorite players to watch currently?" I would say probably like Yamal is up there. I would say Pulisic is up there. The third one, I, third one, I don't really have honestly. If I'm being honest with you guys, I really don't have a third. So, um. The thing is, like, I like to try to consume as much football as I can, you know. And I try to watch the highlights of every league, and, you know, I try to watch all that. There's two players, though, that are my favorite right now. And then the third, I mean, if I had to pick maybe Giorena, I, I really do like to watch Giorena. But the thing is, he just doesn't play a lot of days. He's kind of injury-prone. So, I guess if I had to pick, I'll go with Giorena. But, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, 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 like, it's like that, you know. So, yeah. We'll be to the next question we got here is from Varun1782 says, has football changed for the better or for the worse? Or are fans just simply growing up are stuck in nostalgia? I understand, because the thing is, you know what's interesting with this question is that the players nowadays are simply worse. Like, I look at the players that are, that, like, I look at some of the best players right now in the world. We have, like, the likes of Yamal. We have the likes of Courtois. I'm sorry. These players just don't compare to the likes of Emmanuel Neuer, to Thierry Henry, to Samuel Edzo, to, um, Messi, Ronaldo, Xavi, Iniesta, Maldini, Cannavaro. I can name I, you. I can name, but you get the point. What I'm trying to say here is that the player, the best players in the world, are not comparable to the player, the best players in the past. So they're simply not. I would take a lot of those players over these players any day of the week. There's very few players I'll take over those guys. At the same time, though, we do have a lot of young players coming through. A lot of young players are coming through. The likes of Yamal's coming through. The likes of Pedri's coming through. The likes of Palmer's coming through. You know, etc. And I feel like that's really good to see because I feel like this experienced crew, like the likes of Eden Hazard, Pogba, etc., have underperformed. They have, they have underperformed. And I feel like with these young players coming through, I think it's going to be good to see because let's be real, guys. If we're keeping it a stack here, guys, a lot of those players that we hype up, like Pogba, Hazard, um, Rashford, and those kind of players have underperformed. Those players are essentially in their primes are not the players that we expected them to be. They, these guys have not fulfilled their pro potential. So if you're looking from that sense, it's interesting. Also, I think that's interesting to know here, Varun, is that I feel like football is now more competitive. Back then, I don't think football was as competitive as now. Like, we're seeing teams like uh, Adelanta win the Europa League. We're seeing teams like Bayer Leverkusen win the Bundesliga. And both these teams have not had heritage for much of their history. So the fact that they've been able to win these trophies against the top favorites in their respective competition just shows how football is evolving to more of a manager-based rather than player-based. So I understand what you're saying, Varun, and I do agree to some extent that I do think football has got worse. At the same time, though, I do think football is more competitive. So it's a, it's a good question, Varun. I like this question. 
Next question we got here from CLC. The Stanfield says, "Pick a shark of Europe last week." Um, I'm gonna name one for each competition, then I'll name you my overall of the three. So your Champions League, the probably the biggest shark is probably Benfica four, Atletico Madrid nil. Um, you could also maybe say Salzburg nil, Stadbrest four, maybe Villa one, Bayern nil. I think the Benfica one, just because I don't think anybody predicted Benfica to beat Atletico Madrid by that margin, is quite insane. Europa League, I would probably say Elvesburg beating Roma is up there. And then for Conference League, I would probably say uh, Copenhagen losing to Jaglono. The Polish team is quite good. If I had to choose of the three, I think it's Jaglono. The fact that they're able to win against FC Copenhagen on the road is insane. Remember, FC Copenhagen isn't some this bum team whatsoever. This is a team that made the Champions League round of 16. They were able to beat Manchester United. They were able to beat Galatasaray. And they managed to get a draw against Bayern Munich. Eight points. That's very commendable. When many people didn't even give them a chance. Heck, even people favored Galatasaray even co- over Copenhagen. And don't and let's not forget, Manchester United were the favorites. So, for me, man, I think it's Copenhagen. Copenhagen, for me, losing is, a, is shocking, man. It's shocking. Because they're one of the highest-ranked teams in the Conference League. Sure. Next up says, Murmur578 says, what are your top five underrated managers? Ooh, this is a good question. So, um, I'm going to do one for each league. So, um, for EPL, it's obviously um, Unai Emery. I mean, I think it goes without saying. What he's been able to do with Villa to get them to a Champions League for the first time in 40 years is absolutely insane. It's an insane accomplishment. Um, and then I'll say for La Liga, it's gonna, you might have to say Michelle for what he's got Drona to do to get them to the Champions League for the first time ever in their history, I believe. Is quite insane. Um, and only their like third season back in the top division because I believe they finished seventh the season before. No, no, yeah, yeah. I believe they finished like eighth, actually. Sorry, they didn't finish seventh. And then they got promotion. So, like, it's actually insane how Drona's rise that quickly. The Stuttgart as well, Sebastian Honest, what he's been able to do with Stuttgart to get them to a Champions League position when they were battling the relegation the season before, I believe, last season, which is quite insane. Um, and then for um, Syria, man, I'm probably going to say Bologna when Bologna weren't really looked at that highly. Diogo Mata always been able to do to get Bologna to the Champions League. Now he's looking at what he's been able to do with Juventus. Now he's been able to galvanize the team to look stronger than ever. Probably the best Juventus team we've seen since 18 and 19 season with Cristiano Ronaldo at the helm because the midfield defense looks a lot better now than before. Uh, then for um, League on, I'll probably say um, 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 I'll say Eric Roy was able to get, get stabbed rest to the Champions League. And by the way, guys, this is the first time Stuk- uh, first time stabbed rest are in European competition for the first time ever in history. And there were badly relegation the season before, so that's absolutely insane. So for me, I'll pick those five managers. Honorable mentions goes to Adolf, uh, Adolf Hitler, who was able to do with Monaco to get them to do well, to get them to pot- potentially challenge for a league on title this season. Um, I think that's quite insane achievement. You could maybe also say Deserbi as well, although the players, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you can maybe say something like that. So I'll probably say those five managers and maybe some honorable mentions to Deserbi and Adolf Hitler. I'll potentially say. Uh, next question we got here from SB Cooley says, would you switch a club team if given a chance? The only way I'll switch teams is that Barcelona is like Terminator or like is like basically uh, bankrupt or like they're basically uh, uh, they're, they're basically gone, right? And believe it or not, guys, one French team actually did get um, just one French team don't, no longer exists, Bordeaux. So, like, if Barcelona ever goes in that kind of position, then yes. Otherwise, no. I will still support Barcelona. Even if we're in the second division. Even if we're in the third division. Even if we're in the conference league. I will still support this club no matter what. Even if we're relegated, guys, I will be there. I will be there no matter what. I will always stick with Barcelona, man. So, and the same goes with Charlotte as well. I will stick with Charlotte. So, thank you for the question, SB Kool-Aid. Mass Attack 9 says, what two 11s do you want to see go head-to-head? It can be past 11s, customs, or combined 11s for previous debate shows. Okay. Well, for me, I want to see I want to see this battle take place. Obviously, we'll never see it, but um, let's just pretend we can see it in a hypothetical rule. Real Madrid, 2017 versus Barcelona 2011. I believe this is the best Barcelona team of all time. I believe Real Madrid 2017 is the best Real Madrid team of all time. Have them go head-to-head with one another. And that will be so fun, especially in a Champions League. Like, let's say it's like a testimonial final, like a Champions League final or whatever. That would be insane because I don't know which team would win. I mean, if I had to make a prediction, I would probably edge with Barca 2011 just because of how dominant they were. But Real Madrid, they're the kings of the Champions League, so they could definitely could win. I think it would be a very interesting final to take place, and I would love to see that final. So that would be a good one. 
to see what happens. So let me know your 11s in the comments below, guys. Which two 11s do you want to see? Because I think they'll be amazing. Or maybe uh, the Europe best 11 that we did uh, for the, um, the debate show and the South America best 11. That would also be fun as well. See how Europe compares against South America. That would also be cool as well. Next question we got here from Shre Shreyo. Del 69 says, one player you wish you could have won the World Cup, I can't any longer. Um, I would say Maldini. I feel like Maldini is a player that deserves a World Cup. We talk about him as one of the best defenders of all time. And we talk about how important, how amazing he is. It's so sad he didn't win the World Cup. It's so sad. It's so disappointing. I feel like he could have won the World Cup, obviously. And it's just a shame he didn't. It's just a shame he didn't, man. It's just a shame because he, it would, it would be so amazing for him. But, you know, Italy... Uh, they just haven't been as dominant as before, but um, yeah, I believe you know I you know, but I think Maldini was the selection for two thousand six because he, I think he got injured if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, it's it's a shame, man. It's a shame. Next up, we got from um, but Dor Martyr says, all right, so a lot of teams are trophies. Which trophies do you think the team is most likely to win at first trophy this season? Okay, um. I'm going to stick with my original prediction. I said in my YouTube short at the beginning of the season that Spurs will win a trophy this season. Yes, I know it's crazy. I'm going to stick with it. I think Spurs will win an FA Cup or a Carabao Cup this season. And the last time they won a trophy, guys, was 2008. So it would be 16, 17 years, I suppose you could say. 17 years since Spurs have won a trophy. I would also maybe say Marseille uh, for Ligue 1, potentially. I think there is a possibility for them. Um... And yeah, and then potentially Monaco as well, because Marseille have won the league house since 2009, 2010. That's crazy. And I believe Monaco, the last time they won a trophy was 16, 17, I believe. So yeah, I'd say probably something like that. Let's be real, guys. Whichever team is going to win, uh, be uh, whichever team goes trophy list, whichever team that hasn't won a trophy for so long, it'll probably be a cup competition. I'm not sure about the league. But maybe league on, we can see. But yeah, uh, I would say, I would say probably Spurs is probably the most likely bet for that one. Uh, next up from Albuquerque says, if you review a few of the last couple of young talents who have grown up, like Rashford, Marcia, would you say they've been underwhelming the development? Absolutely, man, absolutely. And I think H did a video on his channel, which I recommend to watch this video, guys, because he goes farther more in depth than I will. Um, he was looking at each of the careers of the players, like Rashford, Marcia. A lot of those players were injury prone. A lot of the players were just injured so often. A lot of the players just weren't as good as we hyped them up to be. Like Rashford just hasn't really performed. Martial has been injury prone. Uh, the same goes for Kinsley Coleman. Sané just hasn't performed, and Rashford has just hasn't performed. Like, a lot of those players and that prime just haven't performed as well as we hyped them up to be. So it's just a shame, man, because they have underperformed. And, you know, the players are actually coming through, like the likes of Lamine Yamal, the likes of Musiala. They might actually be able to eclipse those players like Rashford and Martial. It just shows how sad those players underachieve, man. For sure, man. Next question from Semikiani's 94 says, when do you foresee that we see a new nation win the World Cup? So far, only eight nations have won. And who do you think will be that nation? Okay, that's a good question. Sammy Kiani. Um, I'm going to have to pick a European nation. I just don't see any other continent realistically anytime soon. And for me, for Europe, it's two obvious choices. It's between Netherlands and Portugal. Those are probably the two most obvious. If I had to pick between the two, who would I lean towards? I'm leaning towards more Portugal because I feel like Portugal are kind of kind of I feel like are kind of starting to like be more consistent throughout the years and be more kind of like the main and be more of a top team. At the same time though, Netherlands are good as well. Like Netherlands uh, can do it. So it's a difficult one, Sammy, but I would lean towards Portugal just because I feel like they have better players coming through the Netherlands. Although I will say this though, Netherlands have far more history than Portugal. So I will say it see the thing is like I'm I don't know, man. I'm going to stick with Portugal for now, but Netherlands is definitely a good shout. They're definitely a second place. Uh, yeah, I just don't see any other countries, with any any other continents delivering a World Cup winner anytime soon. A new World Cup winner for that one. So I'd say probably those two. Uh, Brandon Blanco says, um, if the USA had a friendly game in South Carolina, which team would you like to see USA play? Well, for me, I think it would be very awesome. You know, I would love to see USA play against Georgia. I just think it would be really funny. Sure, it's not in Georgia, the state itself. But, you know, South Carolina and Georgia are kind of like neighbors. I think it would be pretty funny. I think it would be pretty funny. And I actually think Georgia's a good team. I think Georgia would actually give USA a good game in preparation for the World Cup. And I feel like Georgia would be very interesting. I want to see how USA does against Georgia. So I would say probably Georgia for that one. Uh, Keyshawn Go uh, Gorani, 769, says, Top three international coaches who you think are underrated? Well, for me, I think for um, South America, it's got to be Nestor Lorenzo. What he's been able to do with Colombia. To get them to a Copa America final, the first since 2001, is quite insane. 
<clears throat> and also, you could probably say you made Colombia the second best national team right now in South America, which is impressive. Ahead, likes of Uruguay, Brazil, and Ecuador is commendable. And given the fact that Colombia were so bad in the last qualifying cycle, he's got this team to make players like James Rodriguez look good. He's got Cordoba that's looking good. You know, this Colombia team looks a lot more organized, synchronized, and it's largely, I believe it's largely the same crew as well. So the fact he's been able to do this with pretty much almost the same kind of players just shows how good he's done as a manager, you know. Um, then for Indonesia, I'm going to go with Shia Young. I think what he's been able to do with Indonesia to get Indonesia to the third round of the qualifiers is an insane achievement. And they're the only country from the first round of the qualifiers to get to the third round is quite insane. And you could, we could potentially see them in this year's, uh, potentially see them at the next World Cup, guys. We could potentially see them which would be an amazing achievement for Indonesia if they can do so, because I believe they have the longest World Cup drought. And then for Europe, I'll probably say the, um, um, I'll probably say um, um, De La Fuente. What has been able to do with Spain? To get Spain to win the Euros this summer, when nobody has, when very few people have Spain to win this year's Euros, is insane with the player, the likes of Yamal, the likes of Nico Williams. And yeah, so I would say those three coaches, in my opinion, are the most underrated. So let me know I could also maybe have said Thomas Christensen for North America. I could also say the Mozambique coach. Maybe actual Guinea coach. I could also say maybe I could have also said Albania, Georgia as well. Let me know, man, your top three in the comments below. Uh, but yeah, those are my top three. So let me just reiterate those top three real quick. I'm going to go with Nestor Lorenzo, Luis de la Fuente, and Xie de Jong Young. I'll probably go with those three. Next up, Tarido Otoma says, top five rules you would change or add in football. Well, I don't have five. I just have two. So I'll tell you the two I would change. First of all, I don't like the idea of a stoppage time. I think stoppage time is dumb. What they should do is pause the clock when there's a stoppage in the game. Don't add stoppage time at the end. Because stoppage time is so inconsistent. A lot of times, referees don't add enough stoppage time. And sometimes we have too much. And sometimes we don't, we don't have enough. So rather to avoid all that nonsense, just stop the clock and just continue the game. Stop the clock and then continue the game when the you know when the the, the the pause is done, right? So that way we can still make it consistent. Another thing I also change is that when it comes to penalty shootouts, after the first eleven takes the penalties, have the substitutes take the penalties. I just find it very weird that it, the the cycle could go on and endlessly, and that if those eleven players keep going, we could be here for all day. In fact, I heard actually my friend was actually telling me a few days ago that there was actually a situation where. They had to do 40 penalties because 11 players were just not missing them whatsoever. And they just gave up and they just, like, said, you know what, let's just do a coin toss. You know, obviously I know it's very unlikely, but the point I'm trying to make here is that I just find it very stupid. Players have to retake the penalty if they've already done it. Every player should take it once. And then after the substitutions, take all the penalties. And if that still doesn't decide, then have, you know, the entire repeat again. But have the substitutions, substitutes decide, in my opinion. That's my personal opinion. Now, they're still on the pitch as well, so I don't know why substitutes don't take penalties. Uh, next up, we got here, St. Jose, 8424 cents. ACL has been more common. Was the new UCL format a bad idea for spending games, plus the addition of Club World Cup? Okay, so, th you know what's weird, St. Jose? At first, when I heard the new Champions League format, I'll be honest with you, I, I was, like, so opposed to it. I was like, bro, this is garbage. This is absolutely just great. I will boycott the Champions League and all that. But then, obviously, as time went on, we saw the draw took place. I saw the fixtures. And I think to myself, okay. Because if we keep it real, guys, if we're keeping it real, as good as the old Champions League format was, it was quite boring. It was quite stale. A lot of the groups are very predictable. You could clearly tell who was the first and second best team. And normally, each of the, most of the groups are very predictable. There was usually one group that was like a group of death where it kind of like anything could happen in that group. But generally, besides the group of death, every other group was fairly straightforward. But here's the thing what I like about the old format is that it was fair. Every team had good... Every team had two home, two away against each of the teams. The new format, though, gives it more balance. Because one of the things I didn't like about the old format was that I feel like some teams got, got lucky with the draws and teams didn't get lucky. So, for example, look at last season, for instance, last Champions League. Arsenal, after, make, after, being, the, after being out of the Champions League for so long, you got a group of Sevilla, Lons, and PSV. Whereas Newcastle, they also haven't been in the Champions League for a long time as well. In fact, longer than Arsenal, got a group with Leipzig, so got a group with Milan, PSG and Dortmund. You see where I'm coming from? Like, uh, some teams get screwed over for the draw, and some teams benefit from the draw. So now, this way, every team has easy amount of games, and every team has bad amount of games. So, like, it's, it's, it, I feel like the new format makes it fair for all the teams. 
At the same time, though, I also feel like we didn't need more games. Because now to win the Champions League, and the old format, you just need, you had 12 games. Now the new format, sorry, you had 13 games. Now the new format, you could potentially have 17 games if you make it through the knockaround playoffs. I just think that's a bit insane. And remember, those extra games are taking place in January as well, and early parts of February. So, I just feel like for me, the schedule is a bit more a mess. And I, I don't like the fact there's more games. You know? And so that's my thing. And then as far as the new Club World Cup is concerned, um, I don't like it. It's too much Europeans. And it's going to basically turn into the Champions League. Although I do think the group stage of Club World Cup would be cool, but as the knockouts go along, it's going to basically turn into the wave of Champions League. So, yeah. Yeah, yes, I do agree with you. There are some aspects of the new UCO form I don't like, and I'm not, uh, I'm not happy with the new Club World Cup as well. Um, next up from Random Bulgarian Maps says, most underrated team in club and international. Most underrated in team, I would say right now in the top five leagues as of this current moment of October 10th, I would say it's Eintracht Frankfurt. I think Eintracht Frankfurt. I've heard many people talk about Frankfurt this season. I think Frankfurt's kind of going under the radar. And given how under, uh, given how underwhelming Dortmund's been this season, and given how Stuttgart is still, you know, in Champions League and stuff, Frankfurt could actually get top four, guys. They could actually finish fourth this season. And Marmouche, that guy has been amazing. Absolutely amazing. And international, I'll probably say Indonesia. I think the most under underrated team right now in um, international football, Indonesia. I think what they've been able to do has been amazing. And um, I hope they can make the World Cup, man. It would be an amazing achievement. Uh, Cherry Colo, uh, Colo Rail says, what teams do you see debuting the 2026 World Cup? Okay, this is an interesting question. So, for North America, I don't see any debutants. South America, I'm going to say Venezuela. Europe... It's really Albania, Georgia, I think, are the two high, most realistic. And as good as Georgia have been, and Georgia have been fantastic, I want to see how Georgia does the World Cup qualifiers. And the same kind of goes with Albania as well. So, Europe, I'm going to, if I had to pick of the two, because I, don't, I think we'll only see one debut from Europe. I think I'm leaning towards more Albania, but maybe Georgia as well. I'm kind of torn, honestly. I'm kind of split. Right now, I'll say Albania just because I feel like they've done it for a far larger period of time than Georgia. Although Georgia is tempting. Georgia is tempting. And then from Africa, it's really Mali. I don't see anyone else. I'm sorry. I think they're the most consistent. I'm sorry. Mali is like the Clippers. They just underperform too much. And then from Asia, I think Uzbekistan has a chance. I think Jordan has a chance. I think those are probably the two best. Um, so I'd say probably Uzbekistan and Jordan probably uh, for Asia. At the Oceania, I don't see any debut. So, in total, I have basically uh, five debutants, I suppose you can say. Um, but, yeah, we'll see how it all pans out, and we'll see how many I can get correct, man. But, yeah, I do think we're going to see five debutants. And I do believe Asia is going to have the most debutants of the uh, the major continent. Next player, a question we got here from Crusher. This is one player wishing to retire so early and why? Eden Hazard. And I know this might seem, seem, seem weird for me to say as a Barca fan, but put the Barca fan to a side. I really do feel like we were robbed of Hazard. I feel like we could have seen Hazard cook at Real Madrid. Obviously, I didn't want it to happen, but as a but as a football fan, it would have been nice to see Hazard do well because I feel like uh, because we saw how good Hazard was at Chelsea, right? And I feel like Hazard for me, the player that we saw would have been amazing with his dribbling, his close control, and I feel like he'd been so fun to watch. Like he's such an exciting player. You know, he's one of he's a, he's a really he's a good player, and it's just a shame the injuries got the better of him. We just haven't seen the true best of Hazard since Chelsea. And I feel like Hazard still had more to offer. I still think he could have done something MLS. And I feel like MLS, he would have been amazing in. Inter Miami, in particular, Messi, Suarez, and Hazard. Oh, my geez, that front three would be amazing. That would be a front three of amazing. And I know probably people are probably thinking you're a Hazard fan. I'm not – I mean, I like Hazard, but I wouldn't say I'm, like, a huge fan of him. I'm, like, not like a fanboy, but I think – I. I, I really feel like we haven't seen it enough of Hazard. And it's a shame because that 18 and 19 season, he was probably he was one of the best players in the world at that time. But yeah, he hasn't lived up since then, man. Best one season wonder, Emily Sky, 1497 says, uh, question asked, uh, for me, it's got to be Leicester City, 2015, 2016. I feel like we're never going to see a team like that ever again. And the fact they won the Premier League and that style is insane. And yeah, it's the best one season wonder because we all knew Leicester City weren't going to defend that title. So, for this question, guys, God, has the use of rigid structure in club football killed individuality in comparison to international where it's less tactically focused? This is actually a good question Adam asked. 
I think it depends on which manager you are in club football. Like, for example, I think if you're under a Pep, I think if you're under Arteta, that it's kind of killed individuality because I feel like those kind of managers are kind of prioritized about the system and how the players operate the system. You have to play a certain style. At the same time, though, we've seen coaches in um, in, uh, club football prior to his individuality. Look at um, Real Madrid, for instance. Carlo Carlo does that. I would also say uh, Hansi Flick also does that as well. There's also many other coaches as well. But the point I'm trying to make here is that I think it depends on the coach. I don't think you can generalize it. What I will say, though, I do think it is less tactically focused. Like, I do agree with you in the sense, though, international is less tactically focused because international, you don't have to meet it week in, week out, you know. And the thing with international, it's just, it's just, it's not, at, you don't have enough time. So you kind of have to just know it, you know. So, yeah, I, I would do agree with you in that sense that I think it depends on the, it depends on the system. It depends on the system. depends where you're playing at. Next question we got here from Ojis Rivia uh, Cerveza. It's about 8750. Hopefully, I didn't butcher your name. Um, anyways, thank you for the comment. India has 1.5 billion published and also one of the best in 96 in Asia. What exactly went wrong for them and how come they're so bad? I actually asked one of my India fans. He actually told me about this. Where I actually, we had a conversation about this. A so shout out to the Indian guy on Twitter. Um, he actually told me that one of the reasons why India has been bad is that they didn't start their football leagues. They kind of like didn't really develop them until like later on, right? And the problem is that because they did it so late, and because a lot of the other national teams have done it, they did it at a much earlier time. They're able to. India is kind of now starting to get into it, you know. I also think that cricket's also been a problem. I also think that you know there's like this arrogance between the federation. But actually, let me just like I don't want. Let me just actually check what he specifically told me because I feel like he told me the best way I could possibly answer this question. So let me get the um, message up here. So let's see what did he specifically say. Just give me a few minutes, guys. Yeah, Kunal. Shout out to Kunal, man. So, yeah, our league is currently on professional and is on the right track. It'll take a few years for it. We'll actually be able to see his benefits for the national team. And, yeah, and then we said they didn't participate in World Cup qualifiers because they prioritized Olympics to Asian Games, which eventually became irrelevant. And FIFA also angry on this approach. And our federation so they didn't care about our football. Um, not enough sports culture. Major parts of people are more focused on careers which aren't risky. Also, corruption in federation, favoritism, selection of players, domestic league clubs, extremely overplaying their players are also part of the problem. Also, not, do not forget our play to FIFA World Cup qualifiers about 30 years. Um, and in the meantime, many countries develop their leagues and football infra, build a culture, and when they ahead of us, our league was semi professional up until 2007, which is really late compared to successful Asian nations. So, yeah, shout out to Kunal. Kunal did a fantastic job. Get, guys, give him a follow on Twitter, man. Please give him a follow because he's a very knowledgeable Indian fan. And what he basically said is that there's a lot of issues with India. You know, the league, the structure, the federation, you know. There's just a lot, man. It's just a very complicated situation. So thank you for that comment, man. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, next up from Oporna Debna, 9277 says, Where does Iniesta rank in terms of Barca legends and Spain legends? Okay, this is a good question. I And I put Iniesta in my thumbnail because I think we have to take the time to appreciate Iniesta. So um, I believe Iniesta for me is uh, top five. I think the amount of achievements he's done, I believe he's won like 38 trophies, you know. And you know what's also crazy with Iniesta, guys? He's one of the most respected players of all time. In fact, I don't think he, you know, I think I actually saw online, he didn't get a single red card in his in appearance at Barcelona. That's insane. I believe he's never got a red card. That's a very, very commendable achievement. Very commendable. And he's also one of the few players to get a standing ovation at the Santiago Bernabeu. 2015, and this is a big deal, guys. Only a few players got a standing ovation. Only three Barcelona players. Well, technically four, but I'm not going to count Jamal since I was a friendly. Maradona, um, Ronaldinho, and Iniesta. Not even Messi. Not even Xavi. Not even Busquets. Not even PK, etc. I've got a standing ovation. So it just shows how highly Iniesta is respected among the football world. Getting back to the question here. Um, Iniesta is definitely top five. I think that goes without saying. And for me, personally, I'm going to put him third. You could put him fourth. It's kind of interchangeable between him and Xavi. Um, I just feel like, for me, Iniesta has far better longevity than Xavi, which is why I put him third. But you could also put him at fourth as well. And the thing is, it's really tough because I really love both players. But I feel like Iniesta, for me, is more fun to watch than Xavi. So I put that little biasness and putting third, but you could put him fourth. It's, like, interchangeable. Either for me, top two is Messi and Johan Cruyff. I feel like Messi and Johan Cruyff are so influential to Barca. They're so significant to Barca. And you, um, Iniesta, as good he's been, 
You cannot put him above those two, in my opinion. And as far as Spain legends, I feel like it's kind of the same with Spain. It's really between Xavi and Iniesta again. Um, I feel like more people will probably say Iniesta is better, the best Spain player of all time just because of his iconic World Cup winning moment in 2010. But I'm actually going to go with uh, Xavi for this one. I feel like Xavi's been more consistent than Iniesta. And it, sure, Iniesta has an amazing World Cup final. I feel like Inia, Xavi for me has been far more consistent than Iniesta. And for that reason, I put Xavi number one. But Iniesta is definitely top one and two for that one. So I would say Iniesta third for Barca. And for Spain, I'll say um, second, in my opinion, for that one. Next question we got here from a uh, discussion type question. So this is actually from Yoser. He just commented the wrong tab, which is why I pretty much copy and pasted this question. So this question is a discussion type question. What is one moment or result in club or international football you would change? Okay, so for club football, I would change the Liverpool for Barcelona. Any other result in that game, other than a 4 0 loss, we would be in the Champions League final. We would win a treble. It would be our third treble in Barcelona in history. We would also crown Messi as one of the best individual seasons as single players ever had in history. I mean, because I'm sorry, that Messi 18 19 season was absolutely insane. He was one of the best players in the world. He had some insane stats that season. Like, that might be his second-best club season in his entire history. Obviously, it's not better than 91 goal season, but it's top two for sure. And I feel like, for me, we would have won a trouble. Because the only reason why we didn't win the trouble is because we lost the Champions League, and obviously we lost to Valencia. And I'm almost positive that we beat, we get a result against Liverpool, we don't lose to Valencia. We just lost to Valencia because it was right after. We were still in depressed mode. We were still in that depression mode. We still weren't there yet. I'm almost positive we would win a trouble. And it would be one of the biggest, amazing achievements Messi's had. Now, international football is a bit tricky, though. Because I feel like international, I could obviously say USA versus Trinidad 2017. But at the time, I feel like it was kind of good we missed out over there. Obviously, it wasn't great long-term. Uh, see, it was bad short-term-wise. But I think in the long-term, it was good for us to not make the World Cup. Because I feel like it really ridiculed the United States. And we had to change. And change occurred. Because I'm almost positive that we made that World Cup, we would get embarrassed. We might we might have still had those players from that 2018 crop still with us, even if they're washed, maybe some part. Um, and then obviously I could also say 2002, USA versus Germany. But the thing is, I didn't watch that game. So I, it wouldn't hit the same. So for me, I'm going to go from games I've watched, because I've kind of watched pretty much from 2018 onwards. Croatia versus France. I think that was the closest we would ever have seen to a new World Cup winner. I don't think we're ever gonna. I don't think I'm ever gonna see a new World Cup winner at this. At, at, I don't think we're ever gonna see a new World Cup winner. And it's, coming from a country like Croatia, it would have been so amazing, so a beautiful story. It would have been so amazing for the players like Mandzukic, Rakitic, Modric, Subasic, Brozovic. Like, would have them in very, very interesting conversations. And I feel like it's such a shame that they didn't win the World Cup because I feel like that would have been one of the. In my opinion, guys, I'm gonna say this right now, guys. If Croatia had won that 2018 World Cup, it'd be the best underdog achievement of all time. It surpasses Greece. It surpasses Iraq. It is the best underdog achievement of all time. To win a World Cup with Croatia against France in that final, that stacked France team, they had Pogba, they had Kylian Mbappe, Griezmann, Kante, Lloris. Ah, man, that would have been amazing. It would have been Cinder. It would have been like a Cinderella story. A Disney sales story, man. But yeah, it is what it is. And yeah, man, so that, that's my um, answers for this one. I really want you guys to answer this one because I really like this question. That's a great question from you, say. Next question we got here from Doodle. Uh, what if Neymar never left Barcelona? You know what's actually interesting, Doodle? We were actually kind of discussing about this on Discord BC a few days ago. If Neymar never leaves Barcelona, Neymar wins two Champions Leagues. I'm almost positive Neymar wins two Champions Leagues. Neymar wins two Champions League. He would probably be the number 10 right now at Barca. He would be our post and Messi. And I feel like he would it would be amazing. He could have maybe won a Ballon d'Or one of the seasons. He could have, I know for a fact, he would have won a Champions League. He would have won some league titles as well. Neymar is going to regret leaving Barcelona. And I feel like Neymar, to this day, will always regret leaving Barcelona. Him leaving Barcelona was one of the b b worst mistakes he's ever committed in his entire career. So for that, I think he would win another Champions League. He would win a, maybe a Ballon d'Or. Ballon d'Or, I'm not sure about, to be honest with you, because that's a bit hard. But he would have won a league titles. He would have won another Champions League and maybe could have won a Ballon d'Or. Maybe. So, I just wish Neymar, man, he never left. And I think, he, you know, honestly, if Neymar, I think Neymar would still be a Barcelona player right now. I think he would be wearing the number 10 right now. And, dude, oh, my jeez. A front three. A Lewandowski, Yamal, and Neymar. Oh, my jeez. 
that front three is that that that's insane. That would be amazing. Oh my jeez, that would be amazing. That'd be amazing. But you know, it's a whatever, man. And I believe it's the last question we got here. Apex one hundred says best keeper of all time. For me, it's Manuel Neuer. Um, I know a lot of people say Lev Yashin, and I think Lev Yashin is a great choice. As sure he's the only keeper winning Ballon d'Or, I feel like Neuer for me has defined goalkeeping to a new level. And I feel like Neuer for me, he's got the best longevity. And I think longevity is so important for a goalkeeper. So for me, I'm going to pick Manuel Neuer. You could also pick Lev Yashin. You could also pick Casillas, Buffon, um, if you guys want. I'm going to go with Neuer, me personally. So thank you guys for answering these questions, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this Q&A, guys. It was a very long Q&A. It was around 30 minutes. So I made it all the way at the end of this video, guys. Comment hashtag 80 Army. And yeah, man, like I said, guys, please want to like and subscribe. And peace out.